So up next, we have uh, Norswap, who's going to be talking about modular sequencing. Norswap, welcome. Happy to have you. Thanks for being here. OK, I'm going to be talking to you about modular sequencing. So I want you to know that I did not come up with the title of the talk. Uh, otherwise, it would have been transaction ordering is a social construct. Who watches the sequencer? MEV is everywhere. Wow, that's a lot. Let's unpack that. First of all, none of this is future plans. We haven't decided what we're going to do about this stuff. It, these are just some thoughts and ideas to explore design space. OK, so uh, you know, don't make investment decision or whatever based on this. Uh, just don't do anything stupid, really. Um, so modular sequencing. Core talked about how the OP stack is modular. And just like everything else, sequencing is something you can change in the OP stack. OK, so what's sequencing? Sequencing is picking which transaction to include in blocks and how they are ordered. OK, and also who sequences these transactions, right? Um, and so who gets to pick and what do they pick? How do they choose? So first, we're going to be talking about who. And today, it's us. It's OP Labs that runs the sole sequencer, so we get to pick the order of transactions. In practice, we just pick them in the order you arrive, first in, first out. It's very simple. We haven't done a lot of work on this yet. Uh, what could go wrong? Uh, no comments, but you, you get some idea. Uh, censorships, all that bad stuff. So what you want to do, really, is decentralize the sequencer, which means having multiple sequencers that cooperate to come up with uh, blocks. Okay. And so what are our goals when we say sequencer decentralization? There are two goals, really. One is liveness, such that if a sequencer were to go down, uh, the network, the L2 chain, keeps progressing anyway. Very important. The other one is censorship resistance. And that's like uh, making sure that we, OP Labs, cannot uh, make your transaction be censored forever and that nobody can force us to do that either, right? The non-goal of this is safety. Uh, optimism is safe, but the mechanism that we use to ensure safety is not this. It's the fault proofs, OK? So even if there's a single sequencer, then the, the chain is safe. Nobody can steal your money. But decentralization is important nonetheless uh, for questions of censorship resistance and liveness. So how do we decentralize? Um, like everything, there's a short-term view and a long-term view. There are things that are easy to do and things that are harder, but maybe more interesting. And so at first, the idea that we're playing with is to have a low number of permission sequencers and to have them run round robin. Round robin. So what that means is that there will be one sequencer. It would take care of a certain number of L2 blocks, like 10 or 100. Uh, we need to figure that out and, and see what's feasible. And then it would be the turn of another sequencer. It would do the same. Okay, and so. If one sequencer is misbehaving or censoring or things like that, he would only be able to do that for a certain number of blocks before another sequencer takes over. And if we diversify the set of sequencer well enough, we put them in different countries and we make sure that they have some vested interest not to uh, misbehave. So uh, they should be like known entities, they have some reputation, or maybe they put a bond that the governance could take from them if they misbehave. Uh, then we ensure that at least one of the sequencers is going to behave correctly and the chain will make progress and your transaction will be included. So there's another model for this, which is uh, interesting. It's called MEVA, and MEVA stands for MEV Auctions. We'll talk about MEV a whole lot in, in the rest of this talk. But MEV, if you don't know what it is, you can think of it as the arbitrage profit, right? If some token is cheap on Uniswap, and it's expensive on Velodrome. While well, you buy it, you need to sell Velodrome, you make money. Who gets to make that money? Well, the first person that notices this and does it. And who gets to decide who's first? Well, the sequencer. Okay. So the sequencer is able to capture these profits if he's aware of them. Um, and so, yeah. And so, since there's a lot of money in this, basically, one way that you could say that the sequencer could, that the sequencer could be decided among a set of sequencers is the sequencer that bids the most uh, gets to sequence the blocks. Okay. There are questions here, right? Like, we, you don't want to make 
to make it so that the same sequencer wins every single auction. So you still need some kind of mechanism to ensure that this does not degenerate in a really bad scenario. But otherwise, that's a pretty solid one to uh, decentralize and also uh, make sure that we capture some, some value through MEV. And I'm going to come back to MEV later. All right. So uh, another model that's interesting is that we could just go and say, well, optimism will behave like a small blockchain. Like a blockchain that's not very decentralized, like some of the blockchains in the Cosmos ecosystem or even Solana. Um, and then we'll run some consensus on all these sequencers and they will come up with a block. And then that's the block that we'll propose to the L1 chain. Um, yes, let me see if I need to add something on that. I think I've covered everything. Uh, yeah, and, and the thing that, the, that this small blockchain is not very decentralized doesn't matter because like I said before, the safety comes from the fault proof. Okay, so even if you have a 51% attack, it doesn't matter. It's just a way to ensure that, um, again, the network is live. So even if nodes go down, it still works and nobody can censor because this mechanism is going to pick different uh, people to propose the block each time. And there are many existing consensus, consensus algorithms we could use for this. We could even reuse the uh, proof of stake algorithm from Ethereum, or we could just do something simpler like Tendermint. Uh, the reason we don't need to reuse the algorithm from Ethereum is that the Ethereum proof of stake algorithm is made for a huge number of validators, right? And we're only dealing with uh, a small number, at least at first. Um, so I've been saying, yeah, sequencer can misbehave. They can, they can do things they shouldn't do. And so I want to like list the, the ways in which the sequencer could misbehave. So a sequencer can lie and just uh, include transactions that don't work. Um, if they do that, if they submit bad transaction, they, just, they will just be ignored, basically. Uh, other sequencer will just read them and say, this is bullshit, it doesn't work. And so they'll be ignored. The other role of a sequencer, so one role of sequencers to pick the transaction and propose them. The other role is to submit output routes. Okay, and output routes is a commitment to the result of executing your transactions. And if a sequencer submits bad output routes, uh, then the fault proof can prove that these are bad and the sequencer will be slashed. And so it will lose the bond that deposited. So it's economically unsound to do this. The other things that can go wrong. Uh, the sequencer can go, can go down, meaning that he will not do uh, his work what it's supposed to do. It can censor, and then it can um, misbehave in terms of MEV, and we'll see later what that means. But say we decide that optimism, we don't want uh, sandwiching, OK? Uh, if you don't know what it is, I will explain it later, but, uh, or, or think front running. If we decide that we don't want that, but the sequencer does it anyway, because technically he's able to, then what we can do in those cases where a sequencer is down all the time, he sandwiches when we said that we don't want that, or he censors, then governance can take some action and uh, just you know, ban the sequencer, basically. And that works if the set of sequencer is permissioned, right? If, we, if you had to apply to become a sequencer and you had to be accepted, then we can ban you and then we, you cannot reapply. If it's permissionless, you, we can't really ban you, right? You'll just go to another server, get a new IP, and then join again. Uh, in that case, it's necessary to have a, a bond that, that governance can slash and basically take your money. OK, uh, like you saw, there's a lot of ideas on how we can do this. But the point I want to make is that all these models are compatible with our current architecture. We can just slot them in. And so that, that's very exciting. Uh, we have like a free reign to, to come up with the best solutions in the short term and then in the long term. All right. second. Topic on modular sequencing. What can we do sequencing? Well, how do we pick the transactions? And surprise, this is a talk about MEV. Okay. Uh, you might have heard about MEV, you probably have, but just in case, what is MEV? MEV is value that can, in theory, be extracted by the actor that has the power of ordering transactions. So in Ethereum proof of work, there was the miners, in proof of stake, it's the validator. And on uh, layer two on optimism is the sequencer. Uh, some people also call that maximal extractable values, but uh, whatever. So how is MEV extracted? And this is a copy. Oh, OK, there we go. 
Um, so how do you extract MEV? So there's different kinds of MEVs, and we're going to review uh, the different major kinds in a bit. That will make it like much clearer. But uh, let's take the example that was before of an arbitrage. If nobody knows that the arbitrage exists, you can just send a transaction, do the arbitrage, boom, you won. Except people might be watching the mempool if it's public. They can see your trade. They can see, hmm, this is a profitable trade. What if I do it before this guy? Or uh, I put higher gas fees, so I will be included first. And so people can actually steal your transaction. This is called front running. So in general, you will need to outbid other people. So in ancient times of the actual blockchains, people did exactly this. They did something called price gas auction, which means they uh, put a really high gas price to be the first in the block. And the miners would include them based on the gas price. Then came along uh, a little company called Flashbots, and they released a software called MEV Get. And they offered MEV get to all the big mining pools. And basically how it works is uh, if you are someone that wants to extract MEV, an arbitrager, um, and now we call them searchers, MEV searchers, you will send your transaction to Flashbots. Flashbots will relay them to the miners. And miners will include them in their blocks based on how much you pay the miners. A very important thing the Flashbots does com compared to price gas auction is that it guarantees that if your transaction is included, it will not revert, which means that uh, basically you can send a lot of money. You, you'll basically check if you get the arbitrage, and if you get the arbitrage, you send a bunch of money to, this, to, the, uh, to the sequencer or the miner, etc. Another thing that Flashbots enables is that it, it enables you to send not only transactions, but also transaction bundles. And so you can see a transaction in the mempool and you can put trades around, so before and after that. And that enables you to do something called sandwiching. And we'll see that in a second. And uh, people don't like that usually. Um, this system has a flaw that is not often discussed is that all the, the mining pools that run MVGF, they can see all the trades sent by the searchers, okay? And so if they wanted to, they could front run all the searchers. They could just steal their trades. Uh, they don't do this because they know that if they do this, they have a loss of reputation. And then if they're found out, they, may, they might be kicked out of flashbots, which will end up costing them much more money than they can hope to make by, uh, by basically stealing a transaction. But they could, and this will be important later. Uh, now we switch to proof of stake. And in proof of stake, uh, flashbots have proposed a new system called MEV Boost. Uh, MEV Boost is something called a, a Proposal Builder Separation System, or PBS. And basically, you get a, an, a new entity, which is a block builder, that builds the block. And then you got the uh, block proposer, and that's like a validator. So if you're picked as a validator in Ethereum Proof of Stake, you can ask block builders to, to bid for the right to pick the transactions in the block. And then the block builders, will now act like the, the mining pools in the previous model. So they will probably run MEV GAF or something like that to get transaction from the searchers. So why did we change this model? The reason is that after proof of stake, no matter what people say, um, validation on Ethereum is much more decentralized. There are a lot of small um, staking pools, there are a lot of small stakers. And we want them to be able to make money. If they get to pick a block, they should also get the MEV money. Unfortunately, you cannot trust everybody with the transactions, right? Because anybody that can see the transaction from Flashbots from MVGAF, they could steal these transactions. And this is okay if you're relying on like six mining pools, right? It's a very limited set of people. But if you have thousands or even tens of thousands of validators, it becomes almost impossible to say who stole the transactions. And so instead, you will know centralizing the, the, the trust into these block builders, and all the validators can contract the block builders. OK, so now let's like, what, what's MEV? Uh, let's see a few flavors. Arbitrage, if there's a decentralized exchange where the price is low, you can buy there and you can sell it higher on other exchange. Very simple. Uh, Backtrending simply means capturing some financial opportunity, 
right after the transaction that creates it, right? That's you want to be first basically, and how to be uh, the first is, is to be right after. And so the biggest example of this is on lending markets. They, they might be liquidations because the price has dropped, the price of the collateral dropped. And so these uh, lending platforms want you to uh, take over the collateral for a, a price in stable coins or something like that. And you will sell it, but they will leave you a margin, which will be your profit. And so people will compete to be the person that liquidates uh, these loans. So that's like a case of, of back running. Uh, simply for NFTs, uh, get, get if, if it's a, you know, completely open mint, uh, the first people to mint get the NFT. And so that's a race. You want to be first to, to mint the NFT. Uh, generalized front running. We saw an example when we say that uh, pools can steal trades from other people. So basically, you'll look at the mempool, you'll look at all the trades, right? And you'll, you'll try to see, well, if I were to do the same transactions, could I make money? And if the answer is yes, then you just do that. You just do exactly the same transaction. You will just bid uh, more than the other guy, and then you will take the profit. So it's called generalized front running. Generalized because you're trying this strategy over every single transaction in the mempool. Um, then we got sandwiching. Okay, sandwiching is kind of complex, but it goes like this. Uh, a user makes a big trade, say on Uniswap or something like that. So say uh, he wants to buy ETH with USDC. The, the MEV searcher says this, uh, saw, uh, sees this, sorry. And so what he's gonna do is gonna do the same trade, but before him. So he's gonna buy ETH for USDC, which pushes the price up. Then the user is gonna make the trade, he's gonna have a worse price. And so that also pushes the price up, right? So if the initial price was X after the sandwichers uh, buys its X plus A, and after the user buys its X plus A plus B. And then the sandwicher turns around and sells what he bought in the first step, okay? And basically, he's able to sell that at a higher price than he bought because the user pushed up the price. And so basically, he's, he's, he's making the price worse for the user and he's, he's pocketing the difference. And so that's, that just makes life shitty for you if you're making a big trade. And people don't like this a lot. There's also something called just-in-time liquidity. Um, I, I'm not sure I'll, I'm going to have time to talk about that. It's, it's a little bit complex to, to get into all the nuances. Uh, but that slide is there, and I will link the slides later. And maybe with time, we'll come back to it. Um, I, I think I'll leave it if there's some questions about it, basically. So MEV, MEV is big business. Um, so this is a screenshot from the uh, Flashbots Explorer, which I took in August, I think. So this is not entirely new, but it gives you, a, you know, a, an order of magnitude on these things, right? Like on a month, 8.5 million on 20, in 24 hours, about 6K. And in total, and I'm not sure uh, how long this tracking has been going on, but like 600 million. So. This is a massive money that's being made here. It's also highly asymmetric, right? Like some blocks will have like massive uh, MEV and some blocks will have very little MEV, right? Like if you multiply 24 hours, the 24 hours number by 30, you don't get the 8.5 million. So uh, it, it's very like asymmetrical. Um, about 33% of this MEV is paid to miners. So this is not a lot, right? You would expect uh, people to know the opportunities and basically bid a lot to the miners, like up to 90%. In practice, we don't see this yet. Uh, maybe we'll see that in due time. Uh, there's been 18 transactions extracting more than 1 million in MEV. It's interesting. And the biggest one has actually occurred on L2. Uh, there there were uh, some 5 million plus arbitrage on Arbitrum uh, a while ago. So, uh, you know, MEV on L2 already exists, even though uh, there's no flashbots, even though there's no auction, there are, there are arbitrages to be made and people will make them. People will make the money. So is MEV good, is MEV bad? People uh, often say MEV is bad. That's a naive take. Um, someone will profit from arbitrage. Like I said, if there's a discrepancy in price, someone will pocket that profit. And I think personally, it might as well be the network that enables those things. And it might go to public goods and to uh, a whole lot of things that are 
that benefit everybody basically instead of just benefiting uh, some guy that runs a, a algorithmic trading or, or some kind of MEV software at home. He's not really doing like arbitraging is useful, but there's no reason you should be paid a huge amount of money for it, right? Um, so sandwiches are almost purely zero sum. Someone that does a sandwich um, is not providing any value on the network. It is possible, so there's been a paper published that says, in some cases, it could be better with sandwiching than not. I, I really doubt that it is relevant in practice, but you could, in theory, you could construct these scenarios. Just, and I mentioned this just to be complete, uh, but you know, my conviction 100%, the world would be uh, better off without sandwiches. Uh, nobody likes front running. Just, you know, people, if you, you know, smell an opportunity, make a good trade, someone steals from you, it's kind of shitty. Uh, and just in time liquidity, um, I didn't get into details, but basically it, 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 this one is good for users, but it's, it's bad for liquidity provider. And in turn, that makes it bad for user in the long term. So preventing MEV is dumb, right? People say we should just prevent MEV. You can prevent arbitrages, basically. Uh, one way that some people try to prevent MEV is to do this thing called fair ordering, which is first in, first out. Um, and this is not fair at all because it privileges uh, organization that can build hardware or infrastructure to reduce latency of, of MEV extraction. Uh, and so, you know, what's fair in that, right? Before you had at least had a competition between guys, uh, it could be at home and you came up with the, the cleverest solution. And now you have uh, the same thing that's as flawed, but also only rich organizations can do it. Uh, this isn't great. And if you do this, you still have a problem that people will try to start spamming uh, to capture opportunities. It's, this is not uh, hypothetical. It's happened on Ethereum pre-Flashbot. It's, it's happening on Solana. It's happening now on, on Binance Smart Chain. Uh, and, and probably on L2 to some extent, though, though not quite as bad. So how knowing all this, like now we've got a big picture of MEV, you know, like it's 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 not good, it's not bad. Uh, we need a solution for it. How do we make sure that uh, we capture all this money for the protocol, for the public goods, for the ecosystem? And there are a few uh, a few solutions for that. So yeah, the goals: uh, capture the value for the protocol, as I just said. Uh, make the user experience good for users. And so uh, for me, that means no front running and no sandwiching. Uh, this is sometimes uh, something people uh, argue with. Uh, they're wrong, you know, like fight me. Uh, maybe we'll get some, some interesting questions around that. But basically this, this works pretty well. And it is actually feasible to, to achieve that. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about how we can do that. Uh, and then decentralize effectively. So all the MEV solution that we came up with must be compatible with sequential decentralization. As we talked before, it's extremely important to decentralize. So how do we do it? Uh, basically, we want to run some auctions, just like flashbots. Um, one thing we could do is just uh, run MEV guess on the sequencers. Uh, the thing is that with Bedrock, we'll have uh, two second block time, okay? And so two seconds is not a lot of time. And if you have to, you know, people need to send their transactions to MEV Gath, you need to simulate the blocks, you need to send that to the sequencer, maybe the latency starts to add up and two seconds is a little bit too tight. What you could do instead is do uh, MEV, so that's MEV auctions uh, via something like MEV Boost. Huh? MEV Boost basically does MEV auction, actually. Uh, and then you would, um, you would offer, you would sell basically the rights to sequence more than one block. You could sell right to sequence 10 blocks or 100 blocks or something like that. Um, so that's uh, for the mechanism. So making auctions, make sure the protocol captures value. And then we could also uh, impose some rules on, on how MEV can be captured. And so the simple and effective rule is no front running. If you can't front run, you can also can't sandwich. And uh, you, you can sort of enforce that. On the short term, you can have uh, governance oversight. So basically we say to the sequencers, guys, it's not allowed to uh, front run. And if they uh, violate this rule, then we can, uh, we can slash them or we can ban them just like we discussed before. This is not great, right? Because we have to monitor uh, what the sequencers are doing and uh, make sure that they don't 
do this and then we have to do a governance vote it's a lot of like drama and uh, people need to vote etc um like I'm, I'm i'm of the opinion that generally governance uh, should be minimized whenever possible and in this case it is indeed possible via technical solutions okay and these technical solutions basically uh, work in two steps the first step is to remove the power of the sequencer to order transactions altogether and there are basically two solutions that are being talked about in the space right now. The first is a first in first all Oracle. So Chainlink has a solution identically called first sequencing services. Again, uh, this has nothing to do with Furnest, Boo. And the other one's called threshold encryption. And that's a solution that uh, a company called Shutter Network uh, is working on. And there may be other people working on that. Uh, yes, there is another company uh, whose name I forgot, Entropy. Maybe entropy, but I'm not sure. Uh, but in both cases, basically, you have a network node that provides an ordering for the sequencer to respect, right? In the first in, first out Oracle, how that works is that all the nodes in that network, in the first sequencing network, they will recite, uh, receive a bunch of transactions and they will say, they will give their ordering of transactions. And if a majority of them are honest, then it's impossible to front run, basically. In the threshold encryption case, you will send your transaction encrypted to nodes in the, in the network. And they will make an ordering of the, the encrypted transactions. Nobody knows what, what's doing what. The sequencer will sign on the ordering. And then the network, the, the shutter network, for instance, uh, will come together, create a key to decrypt all these transactions. Then you, you, you get them decrypted after the sequencer has said, yes, for sure, I will use this ordering. So that's how you take the power away from the sequencer. Now you cannot order anything. And so as a user, if you use this, this solution, you know that you won't be front run or sandwiches or, or anything like that. The next step is to reintroduce some form of auctions because we still want to capture MEV and we still want um, that value to go through protocol and to public goods. And how you do that is that you conduct uh, two kinds of auctions, ideally, uh, a top of block auctions for things that should go at the top of the block. So see, uh, say last block after the transaction will reveal, you're like, oh, there's a massive arbitrage now. Well, you can bid to be on top of the next block. And then some uh, transaction also create a massive MEV, just like, uh, let's say, um, Oracle updates. And so this could be in a public pool and people could bid to background them. The reason why you could say, well, why don't we just put the, um, Oracle updates encrypted, and then we reveal them, and then people will bet to be on top of the next block. That doesn't quite work. The reason why it doesn't quite work is that people will know the Oracle is coming, and they will start spamming to be uh, by luck after it, right? They'll just like spam a whole lot, and then uh, they will get they will get to be in the same block uh, after the encrypted Oracle update. So you have to you have to do something special for them. You have to allow background auctions, basically. And I think this is the end of, okay, indeed the end of our presentation. So some conclusion there. Um, so the OP, the OP stack and Bedrock are the, the first incarnation of the OP stack. They are flexible and you can easily change sequencing and we will indeed uh, work on that in the future. And the goals with uh, changing sequencing would be to decentralize for liveness, for censorship resistance and to extract MEV so that we, we actually value to the protocol and the ecosystem and the public goods. Uh, what are the best solutions? Well, that's still, we're still thinking about that. We're still talking to people in the industry. Uh, if you are smart and you have some ideas there, feel free to message me. Uh, I love to talk about that stuff. And there are short-term and long-term solutions. Uh, on short-term, we can use the governance as a crutch to sort of say, hey, guys, behave or else. Uh, but in the long run, there are technical solutions that we can implement that make sure that no matter what, you can't misbehave. All right, I've been Norswap. You can find me uh, basically everywhere. Uh, my handle is Norswap, including on Twitter. And uh, yeah, if, if people have questions, I think we have a, a tiny bit of time. Hey, Norswap, good to see you, man. Hey there, uh, how's it going? Good, yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, there were a couple of questions, so I'll just kind of ask them to you here directly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so first question here is just about kind of the, the fraud proofing and, and how that works. Is it, you know, somebody individually is submitting um, that there's kind of a fraudulent thing that's happened. And if that's the case, then 
you know, how would you go about preventing people from front running the the fraud proof basically and, and getting the reward for doing so? Oh, that is that is such a good question. I love it. Um yeah, that is that's a difficult question. I think like the the disappointing answer is that you would go through something like flashbots that has like sort of an, a, a trust agreement not to front run, because uh, otherwise it's really difficult. Um, I, I've, th I've thought about this a little bit, like we're not quite there yet. Really. We still need to build actually like the, the, the technology of the fault proof fully. And this economic part comes even after that. Um, but I've thought a little bit with like trying to compensate people that like contribute but it's really difficult because then you can just like sort of copy what our people are doing without doing your own work and you don't want that either so it's a real problem gotcha and then uh, another question that came up uh was and i know we have one minute left which might not be enough time but uh you know you mentioned as one of the uh the ways to deal with that uh, cat is here uh to deal <laughs> with uh, mev is, is sort of you know, threshold encryption is one of the kind of the ideas that uh, that's been put out for for managing this. Can you maybe chat a little bit more about like the interaction of threshold encryption and, and MEV and, and kind of how that might be a, a way to mitigate it? Yeah, so threshold encryption basically, um, well, threshold encryption I should first explain is you have a, like this private key and you split it between all the, a bunch of people and in this case, the nodes of a network. But the public key is known to everybody. And so as a user, you encrypt your transaction with the public key. And only when the nodes come together to create the private key, can you decrypt uh, the transactions. And so it's a way to basically uh, remove the, the power of the sequencer to order the transaction, because now you are ordering uh, encrypted transactions. You have no idea what's going on there. And then the sequencer will commit itself to them. And then later you can reveal. And so it, it's a way to make sure basically you can't front run uh, or, or sealed uh, opportunities or sandwich and things like that. And if you want to extract MEV, then you need to introduce auction, but you can do that in a way that you can't uh, do these bad things, basically. Gotcha. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for being here and uh, running through your talk with us, uh, modular sequencing, which was actually um, just a secret MEV talk in disguise, um, as almost <laughs> all of them are. Uh, but yeah, thanks for being here, Norswap. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, if anybody else has any questions, uh, feel free, as, as Norswap mentioned, to, to grab them at any platform at, uh, at Norswap. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Loved it. See you around.